this my job just to give you a very quick uh, uh, presentation with regard how to digest this guideline. Just before I start my talk, I would like to extend our welcome to uh, our uh, faculty, Dr. Uh, Abdullah Tayyib, who is a consultant cardiologist in Saudi Arabia, as well as Dr. Abdul Rahman Jamil, and Dr. Mohamed Agrid, consultant cardiologist from Freeman Hospital, Dr. Wabakir Khalil, cardiologist in Ireland, and Dr. Mohamed Abdel Ghadir and Dr. Uh, Ahmed Noor al -Bagi. So I have nothing to declare, and I'm not going for this slide, as already mentioned that in details. So the case presentation here, I would like to present 52 years old gentleman who is usually fit and well, he's very independent. Come to see his GB in, with history of uh, typical cardiac sound just then. And I'm not going to tell how is the, what's the definition of typical angina or atypical angina. So he had two to three time per month at rest and sometime during the effort. He does not have any past medical history and he's not on any medication. His cardiovascular risk factor include his father had MI at age of 52, and his blood test showed that his uh, LDL cholesterol 3.2 millimole. He had normal ECG, and his vital side completely normal as well as his uh, cardiogram examination. So, as Dr. Him just pointed out, uh, to assess a patient with uh, chronic coronary syndrome uh, guideline, recommended that to start with the initial assessment diagnostic approach. So assessment and perform clinical investigations. So history are really, really important. And of course, it's possible to achieve the high certainty on diagnosis from history alone. But of course, clinical examination and bedside tests and objective tests are very important. And that is mainly to confirm your diagnosis, to exclude alternative diagnosis, and also to get a, a, a clue about the severity of underlying disease. So as Dr. Hing just mentioned that typicality of typical, atypical, and non inguinal chest pain, I'm not going to go that in details. Our patient clearly, he had uh, two out of uh, three. He had uh, chest pain, typical cardiac sound chest pain, precipitated by physical uh, exertions. It's really important now to certify him as atypical angina because when we come to pre-test probability, that will help us to select appropriate uh, investigation. And again, this is the Canadian uh, Cardiovascular Society created of the angina. I'm not going to go on that. So grade one, angina with uh, heavy exertion. Grade two, angina with moderate exertion. Grade three, angina with mild exertion. And grade four, that angina at rest. This is really helpful when you come to differentiate between stable versus unstable angina because the management and pathway is a little bit different. So going back to our patient, clearly he had a stable angina, which is nowadays we call chronic coronary syndrome, as we just hear from the guidelines, and he does have atypical cardiac sound chest pain. The second step when you come to the patient with chronic coronary syndrome, you need to consider comorbidities, general health life, and you need to ask very clear and detailed history because that is really important when you need to decide about the revascularization. If the patient had a good quality of life, and um, he should be considered for uh, revascularizations. Uh, alternatively, if his uh, quality of life not very good with a lot of comorbidities, and from your uh, assessment felt that the revascularization future, then you could start on the angina medication even without a diagno uh, diagnostic approach, without any non-invasive diagnosis. So our patient, he is uh, very independent and his quality of life good and he should be considered for revascularization if needed. Again, <laughs> step three in the guideline to uh, perform uh, basic testing, blood test, ECG, chest X-ray. And again, I'm not going on details, but clearly the guideline, as you can see that class 1B echocardiogram is really important and that is mainly to rule out any alternative cause of chest pain, like uh, valvular heart disease, heart failure, pericardial disease, and also to get the idea about uh, uh, left ventricular systolic and diastolic function, and also to uh, uh, assess if there's any other uh, cause like a cardiac tumor or any uh, pericardial effusion or any alternative cause. So clearly you can see this patient, his echocardiogram for those who are not cardiologists, this is for a standard short axis view. And we're looking now here to mitral valve. 
which is uh, we can see it's normal as well as aortic valve normal and moving forward otherwise there is no significant valvular abnormality and this is uh, for chamber view I apologize the image quality is not very good but clearly you can see he got a good LV systolic and diastolic function so moving forward uh, assess retest probability uh, and clinical likelihood of coronary artery disease again this is really important and uh, just for time sake, and I'm not going to go in details what's the difference between 2014 just pain pretest probability and 2019 pretest probability. But clearly, the recent guidelines is very, very accurate when you come to pretest probability. So, going back, we're dealing with 52 years old gentleman. He had atypical cardiac sound chest pain. So, his pretest probability is 17. And according to the chronic coronary syndrome guideline, that uh, region shaded with dark green color, this is when the breeders probability between uh, five to uh, between above 15. And the guideline clearly indicate that this kind of patient, uh, she should be considered for non-invasive test. For a patient, for the area shaded with a light green, that being five to 15, the guideline recommend non-invasive imaging may be considered after a careful assessment to the patient. And for patient with pretest probability less than 5%, that is clearly very low pretest probability and unlikely got underlying coronary artery disease. And clearly you could discharge patient without any further investigation. And in non-invasive investigation, I'm talking about European society, not NICE guideline, which is completely different from NICE guideline. NICE guideline recommended any patient who is chest pain should undergo uh, non-invasive imaging. So again, as Dr. Halzain just pointed earlier, uh, when you assess patient with pretest probability, it is really important also to consider that the cardiovascular risk factor, looking for any abnormal ECG or echocardiogram, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, or any high calcium score on CT scan. And if so, that will categorize patient at high clinic likelihood of coronary artery disease. So moving forward to step five. And before that, just to remind you again, our patient is 52 with atypical cardiac sound chest pain and his pre-test probability 17%. And he does not have high clinically likelihood feature. So the guideline in step five indicate clearly when you requesting, when you're selecting the uh, bedside, uh, when you're selecting diagnostic, diagnostic test, you need from your history and assessment, clinical assessment, you need to decide what kind of test you can choose. You can go direct to invasive test if you felt this patient with high clinically likelihood of coronary artery disease. And if your patient had a typical inguinal symptom at low level of exercise, and also if his symptom not responding very well to uh, medical initial medical therapy. On the other hand, you can choose non-invasive imaging like CT coronary angiogram. And again, I'm not going to go in details what's the level of evidence on that, but clearly that level uh, 2A, non-invasive coronary angiogram that you need to have a patient with a good quality. I mean, his body mass index less than 35, with good heart rate, less than 75 beats per minute. He's not in atrial fibrillation without previous history of ischemic heart disease or his 10. And again, you can choose not to do any test in very low uh, pre-test probability patient and you can consider alternative diagnosis. So I'm not going on this in this again, as mentioned by Dr. Alzheimer. Yes, I will go direct. This is a CT scan. Our patient, his pre-test probability is 17. And he had a low, low range of clinical likelihood of coronary artery disease. And there is no brief diagnosis of coronary artery disease. There is no brief assistance because if you had brief assistance on the CT scan, you could have a blooming artifact, which is good the quality, which he will give you inconclusive test. And uh, he had high clinical likelihood of good imaging quality. He had in sinus rhythm, his heart rate less than 70 beats per minute and he is able to hold his breast during the test. So here we go. This is his uh, CT coronary angiogram. As we can see, 
which show that single uh, left anterior coronary artery disease with heavy calcification in proximal vessels, 70%, and in uh, nearly about 70%, and in mid vessels is about uh, 50 to 60%. So going back to the guideline, now what we need to do for this patient, choose appropriate therapy based on symptoms and event risk. Again, just to recap, we're dealing with 52 years old, atypical cardiac sound, chest pain, pre-test probability 17%, and his CT coronary angiogram showed that he had proximal left anterior uh, coronary artery, left anterior disease. And Clearly, his CT scan showed that he had proximal LAD disease, left anterior descending coronary artery disease, which is uh, categorizing as a high risk patients. So for prognostic reason, according to the guideline, he started on antinginal therapy, started on aspirin 75 milligram and high intensity aspirin. And also for symptomatic reason, uh, beta blocker was initiated. He was reviewed in two weeks time as, by, as, as advised by the guidelines. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to complain with the medication. He complained from fatigue and there is no, he had no motivation to try any further anti-inginal medication. So now the question, what we want to do for this patient? So uh, clearly this patient had high cardiac, uh, high event risk, cardiac mortality around 3% as indicated by coronary CT scan. And guideline at this stage here uh, advice clearly invasive coronary angiogram may be indicated if non invasive uh, test suggested that patient high event risk for determination of option for revascularizations. So, where you go now, this is his coronary angiogram. And now I would like to uh, invite one of the panel, Dr. Abu Abdul Hamid, if you, Dr. Abu Khalil, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Abdul Azim. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Okay. Thank you for the nice presentation. So as we can see, uh, there are two panels of uh, coronary angiogram pictures here. The, on the uh, left-hand side um, to the viewer, uh, this is the left coronary system. Uh, obviously, on, this is a cranial view, so you can't really uh, tell about the distal left main or the osteal LED or the osteal circumflex. But you can certainly see there is a significant um, likely hemodynamically obstructing disease starting from the proximal LED and then extending further down, less severe probably, maybe moderate, uh, all the way to the second, sep uh, second diagonal branch and slightly beyond it. So it, it looks like a significant proximal LED uh, disease. The circumflex does show some eccentric or concentric um, mid-circumflex disease. I'm not sure about the proximal part in this view. Then on the other set of the panel on the right hand side of the viewer, this is the right coronary artery, it's a gigantic vessel. This is the left anterior oblique picture. Uh, it does not split the distal bifurcation, so you need a cranial view. So you could probably do an LAO cranial to start with, which gives you a combination of the LAO view and the distal bifurcation opening or you can just do an LAO as you did in this case and then move to a cranial picture so you can open the distal right coronary artery bifurcation into big PLV and big, probably big PDA. I can't comment on the distal part very well. The proximal part and the mid part has got mild to moderate diffuse uh, atheroma, which is non-obstructive. Thank you very much, Dr. Obak. Uh, and uh, my apology for, I don't have uh, all his image, uh, but clearly as Dr. Obak uh, said that this patient had la his coronary angiogram largely confirmed the CT coronary angiogram finding, which is showing that he got proximal left anterior coronary artery about nearly 70 to 80% disease with mid left anterior coronary artery disease. And also he does have uh, a small cerco with uh, moderate plague as stated by Dr. Obak and there's no clear uh, uh, disease on his right coronary artery. So the difficulty here, what's going to do for this patient? So what's the next? So I apologize, I should have this as polling uh, uh, question, but now I would like also to ask Dr. Abdullah Tayyip, what's your uh, next approach for this patient? Dr. Abdullah, can you hear me? Dr. Abdullah? Okay. Dr. Obak, would you like to comment on the next step in this vision? Yeah, I suppose uh, we're looking at uh, a fixed picture. We're not looking at the actual dynamics of flow 
we're not assessing uh, some, some views. But this is likely to be a single vessel disease which need further assessment or uh, treatment. Uh, to me, it does look obstructive. If the operator is not convinced that it does look hemodynamically obstructive, this is exactly where we have um, uh, FFR uh, stress assessment to, to assess the significance and the obstructive nature of the disease. Uh, so I would, I would probably proceed for an FFR guided assessment, particularly that this patient had, had none uh, stress assessment. So he had a CT coronary angiogram, which would show you um, the uh, severity, maybe would show you some disease, but it wouldn't give you any functionality. And this is stable coronary, uh, this is stable angina uh, symptoms. So you'd want to confirm this is significant. And you may also want to confirm how low does the FFR go to. Uh, obviously, if you have a borderline FFR, you could make a good case for medical therapy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, can you hear me? Can you? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, but basically, uh, as Dr. I think probably Dr. Um, have, left, have, left, have left nothing for me to comment on. Well, lesion is significant uh, uh, and geographically, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, distal lesion is moderate. Uh, so basically, um, uh, uh, IFR uh, can be done just as a confirmatory, but uh, it is uh, uh, it's going to be positive. Uh, you know, so if we do it, uh, then we confirm uh, the positivity of the test. So basically, why you have done the coronary angiography uh, from the start, uh, I think probably. Uh, I don't think we are going to go all this way just to continue uh, medical therapy. If you find the IFR is, uh, or the FFR is, is positive, uh, probably, uh, I think uh, the patient is already on the table. I think probably we'll uh, go for uh, BCI to the proximal lesion. Uh, and then after we fix it, we might just repeat the IFR just to confirm that the distal lesion is not significant. Uh, I still, we'll continue with... Um, uh, other medical therapy. Uh, so we'd like just to know, Abdulazim, what did you do? Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. And uh, clearly, I think we all agree with you, Dr. Obakar and Dr. Abdullah. Uh, this patient should go for FFR. And also, just I would like to uh, remind you in FAME 2 trial in patient with stable coronary artery disease, an initial uh, FFR uh, assessment guided BCI strategy was uh, associated with. Uh, a significant lower rate of myocardial infarction if revascularization will form in patient with uh, positive FFR lesions. So clearly, as you can see here, our uh, patient, he had FFR, which is very strongly positive, which is only that 0.71. Uh, and therefore, the next step is going to be revascularizations. And according to uh, 2018 ECS uh, REFAS guideline, to a image should be uh, to a image uh, recommended. So here we can see this is a pre uh, test the OCT, which is uh, uh, very helpful to determine the uh, uh, region of the disease precisely. And also it's really good to give you uh, insight about the uh, extent links and extent diameters. And also will give you a uh, very good uh, uh, opinion or, or very, very good thought about what is the component of the, uh, the plague. So here I would like to uh, invite Dr. Mohamed Agri to comment on the OCT image and also to give us uh, just like a tip on how is OCT or IBUS helpful in this kind of lesion. Dr. Mohamed, can you hear me? Right, okay. So I don't think uh, Dr. Mohamed, uh, sadly, I think as we lost a connection with him, but uh, here we go. This is his uh, OCT, uh, which showed that he definitely had uh, proximal and mid LED lesions. And as we can see, did the calcification, one of the components of this plague, and he got uh, proximal fissures which around 3.3 uh, diameters, and distal mid fissures around 
3.1 so the next step to select your uh, stent so he had uh, this the lesion had been stented first and the, as you can see on the OCT that's showing that the uh, side branch was wide, widely uh, open which is diagonal branch and also showing that the, the stent little bit under excavation so further correction needed and there is no distal complications and further stent had been implanted to the proximal LAD with uh, very good final uh, coronary angiogram and OCT results. So, uh, Dr. Abdullah or Dr. Obak, any comment on the final result here? I just wonder, I mean, can you do any stent distal? I mean, the distal lesion now looks, uh, looks better. It doesn't look like as bad as it was before. Um, so did you do a, your, your stent was uh, just before the diagonal or both diagonal? So the, the uh, 3028 uh, uh, stent had been implanted just uh, above the first diagonal. And after the first diagonal and extended out the, the lesion. So there's the first stent that mid LED and the second stent that proximal LED was uh, 35, yeah, 305. 3, 5, 20 to the proximal lesion. So I think, uh, Abdullah, they have stented distal to the second diagonal on, on that view. Right. Yeah, mm. I think they've stented distal to the second diagonal. So 3028 uh, back mm. to uh, just before the second diagonal and then an overlapping 3528 further back. So you can see on this, on this view, that's after yeah. the first stent. It's already mm. better. Maybe it needs further optimization with NC balloon across the diagonal. Mm -hmm. They've also protected the branch with a small, with a, with a wire. Again, it's very controversial. Some people will or will not. The question, uh, the question to you, Dr. Uh, would you uh, go as far as the, uh, the second lesion or are you just going to uh, deploy a focal stent on the proximal uh, disease and then repeat the IFR for the distal? Because we know that actually the longer the stent, the more uh, risk of stent is to know. Yes, angiography is going to be, looks great and good. Uh, but again, I mean, you might lose this diagonal branch. Uh, again, you have a long stent, so you'll have the chances of stent is to know in the future. Uh, and I think probably uh, we have the IFR where it's still there. I think probably, uh, I personally, I would have just fixed the proximal part of the, or the proximal disease and then reduce the IFR. And if there is um, a significant lesion distally, I would make another stand. Uh, do you agree with me, Abakr? Yeah, that's actually a very good point, Abdullah, because at the end of the day, you will not have one stent that will cover the whole lesion if you're planning to do normal to normal. So you, know, you need two stent strategies. And if you think uh, the teaching would be to stent distal and come back proximal, but if there's any question about how severe the distal part is, which your IFR and your FFR will give you an idea. Because when you do a pullback IFR or pullback FFR is actually more accurate, you would know to some extent how significant or how much contributory that distal or mid LED disease compared to the proximal part, which is likely to be uh, the more contributing disease. So if you were going to do two stent strategy, I would say I would do exactly what Abdullah has done by putting a stent proximally and optimize it and choose a, a proper length to start with. And then if you have to overlap distally, you would overlap only if the FFR, repeat FFR or IFR is significant. So that's a very good point, Abdullah. I think we have moved away from, from reassessing. Uh, we're not doing it as frequent where we should um, to ensure that you know, we're implanting metals on those patients and the, there's increasing chance of uh, restenosis and, and, and bypass in the future and even cardiovascular events. So it's, it's a very careful, very stepwise uh, suggestion by, by Abdullah, which is, which is a very good suggestion. Thank you. But by the way, I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Abdullah Alim. It's really very good final result. And uh, basically it was guided by, uh, by IFR initially and then also by OCT. You did a very good job, uh, and even just my comment is just uh, maybe my, my, my approach for that case will be a little bit different, but at the end of the day, you have a very good final result. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Obakr, and thanks, Dr. Abdullah. Um, I can't disagree about what you said. It is uh, it's a really uh, helpful and very good tip uh, point for me, and I think it's for time, for seeking time. 
I would just uh, conclude my slide by this patient basically discharge hormone, what's guideline and medication recommended as just Dr. Kim mentioned her slides, spring for life, clopidogrel for six months, and ribosatin uh, 20 milligrams, and his, uh, the aim for him to have LAD less than 1.4 and only brazo 20 milligram, and there's no beta blocker or inhibitor as his LV uh, function was normal on his echocardiogram. Three months later, this patient who was planning to go to Kalimincaro has been assessed with treadmill test, and he uh, free from any symptom. Uh, thank you. Now I think I would like to conclude the, to uh, close this session, and uh, if any comment on post-talk on chronic coronary syndrome, and any comment on this case presentation, we are more than uh, happy to receive any question or any comment uh, from you, Dr. Obakr, Dr. Abdullah, and from no, the no, audience. No comment from me for sure, uh, except hint uh, presentations are always enjoyable. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, right. So, uh, Dr. Abdullah, any comment or any question on this post? Uh, I mean, the first talk was really no, good. No, uh, no, that, uh, no, not really. It was a comprehensive talk, and I enjoyed it very much. And even the cases which you are presented were really nice and good. Thank you very much. Thank you.